Well, this is so exciting, Vicky. I, uh, I almost can't wait to get started. Yeah, you should be doing this in the middle of a thunderstorm. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> this guys for me in Vermont. This oh, is the best part that. of our organization at home. Um, we're in the 2,000, 3,000 homes. I'm not, I'm not even sure. So that also means 2,000, 3,000 home bars. Normally the finals is a big event with a bunch of people crowded in a room and a bar cart rolling in uh, and an open bar. So unfortunately I can't, serve you all drinks, but uh, you can enjoy and imbibe however you like, um, because, or eat that popcorn, uh, perhaps, that Never's Nation has provided you in your little swag box, uh, because it's gonna be a great time. It's gonna be a lot of fun. All right, so we have uh, two amazing contestants that have made it through our many rounds. So let me just roll out what's happened so far. So we announced the Pundit Cup a couple of weeks ago. And to be very honest, I was, we didn't know how anything would work. First, because we've actually never done the Pundit Cup ourselves. Um, that's something that our friends at Social Security Works had run for four years, which is a lot of fun. It was a raucous good time. But we thought we would take it over this time and they were enthusiastically happy with it. They, were, they helped us judge uh, last time as well. Um, and so this time we thought, okay, that's gonna be really great. But then the pandemic happened. And once again, we were plunged into uncertainty because how do you do this pundit competition uh, when everyone is stuck at home? Will there even be a conference? And the executive director of Netroots Nation, Eric, called us up and said, no, 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 I think you should still do it. We've got this different kind of app and you should give it a try. And so we checked it out and we thought, well, what can we move online? And what can we do now online that we're at home that we couldn't do before? So it's been quite a journey with a bunch of ups and downs, um, but we came together and we have a lot of people to thank for that as well. So first, let me thank all of the contestants. We had four, over 40 people sign up. Uh, we asked them all to submit videos and then we chose among the videos that were submitted and we chose eight quarter finalists. So on Wednesday, we had them all go head to head um, in pairings and we chose um, four of those to advance. And so yesterday, Thursday, we had um, four competitions, two head to heads. And that's why we have the, the competitors we have today, whom you'll meet in a minute. Um, so, uh, so that's super exciting to me. I also wanna thank all the judges that we've had uh, coming in. So we've had different judges all of whom are professionals within the communications world in politics and nonprofits. And we'll meet a couple more today. And they are people who uh, around, around the industry have come and lent their expertise to us and have really made it a, a fun time, but also an instructive time for us, something that's, uh, that's constructive and instructive. Um, and I want to thank the sponsors, and we'll meet another one uh, today. Um, but Fenta Communications and Fireside Communications have been um, fantastic sponsors for us, along with, of course, ourselves, Convey Communications, um, and um, the folks at Social Security Works helping us out as well. So thank you to all of you. Um, let me, uh, let's introduce ourselves, shall we, Vicki? Do you want to go first? Yes, hi, sure. <laughs> I am in the middle of a thunderstorm and uh doing a few tech things here and so i'm um, coming back to earth right now hi everybody it's so great to have you all here i'm so excited for this uh performance today that's the part i like the most the performance aspect because that's me i'm that kid i'm the theater kid i'm the drama geek and that is what i want to bring to this whole situation i want everybody to perform well to shine their light the best they can and be noticed <laughs> Lovely. And my name is Arshad Hassan. Uh, along with Vicky, we founded Convey Communications together. Um, I came at this from a different perspective. I was an executive director way young, super young. I wasn't quite 27 yet when I took over a national political organization. And wow, did I learn quickly how important it is to communicate well. You can have all the great ideas, you can do all the great program work, but unless you can convey your idea out into the public, it really doesn't pick up any steam. So getting on TV, getting on stages, doing all that stuff was things I had to learn as we go. 
um, I think I got pretty good at it. So um, together we run Convey Communications. It's a firm dedicated to lifting up and making uh, clear the voices of our new and emerging leaders, particularly women, people of color, and LGBTQ um, leaders within the progressive movement, whether in politics or nonprofits. We believe our voices deserve to be heard. We're the new leaders who are um, forging a path forward. So that's why we're here. Um, so thanks very much for all of that. Um, let's introduce some of the judges. Do we have Brad Bauman? I'm pretty sure we do. We do, let's call him up. Ta -da! Ta -da! <laughs> <Hello>. <laughs> Brad. Hey everyone, how you doing? Good, good. I'm at least I'm not in a thunderstorm. Yeah, indeed, indeed. It's a little sunny outside today, so that's nice. Same, same. Sunny Vermont for me. Um, Brad, tell us who you are and tell us about Fireside uh, uh, Communications, Fireside Strategy. Well, yeah, well, thank you, thank you all very, very much for allowing me to participate in this as a uh, get, as a, uh, a judge. Uh, I am the managing partner of Fireside uh, Campaigns, which is very, very happy to be a sponsor for this event. Uh, we are a full-service progressive communications firm that offers uh, PR, crisis, digital support, fundraising, advertising. Uh, we've got 27 staffers working over four departments on over 40 very, very important campaigns and progressive causes including Black Lives Matter, Mi Familia Vota, uh, the DLCC, and of course, uh, Sister District Project, which I believe one of our, uh, one of our uh, contestants today is representing. And I am just thrilled to be here with everyone. Awesome, we're thrilled to have you. What, you, what Brad didn't mention is he's competed in the Punda Cup before. I'm I'm a perfect color commentator for this because um, <laughs> I was a finalist in 2018. Uh, so I've been to the big table, but I've never brought home the brass ring. Wow. Well, that's actually kind of amazing because here you are now running a full service communications firm. Uh, so that could be you. That could be one of our finalists. Yeah. Uh, but just imagine what we could be capable of though, right, Brad? That's absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, Brad, I have a question for you. What is one thing that you're looking for? Um, I know you're looking for many things, but what is what is what is your your big tip as a, as a professional and as a former contestant? No, I appreciate that. Um, the first is to be authentic. Remember that your voice when you're on TV or when you're before the press is critical to the ongoing success of our movement. And all of the emotion, all of the care that you bring to your work should be communicated through your stage presence and through the ways in which you are helping us move this movement forward for all of the people who need our help and need us to make this a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive world. So thank you. That was really great. Thank you, Brad. Um, next, we're going to put you back in the audience and we're going to call up Jocelyn McCurdy Keats. Jocelyn, are you with us? She is. There she comes. Woohoo! Right now? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Fantastic. <laughs> so good to be here at the famous Pundits Cup. One of my favorite parts of the year, for sure. Awesome. How is everybody feeling? I'm, I'm really excited. I'm very excited. Uh, Jocelyn, now I know that you are, um, uh, you've got your own show and you also, in addition to having your own show, which I'd love to hear about, um, you're also a producer at ACT TV, which Netroots Nation is using for, uh, for, our, for all of our broadcasting, for the keynotes and whatnot. Yes, we've been live streaming all of the things now that we have a digital Netroots, which I think is a first. And, you know, Act TV does, we do, we live stream all the protests in DC. And that is, that is how I spend my days in a non-socially distanced world, running around, covering all these wonderful, amazing organizers and all the great work people do on the progressive left. And yes, you should totally come watch our show on Act TV at 11 a.m. Uh, Solidarity Live with me and Alex Lawson. It's great. Nice. nice. We had Alex here uh, yesterday uh, judging as well. So we got some of his uh, insightful advice. He's pretty good at that. 
for sure. Yes, he, is. he is. Well, Justin, I would love to hear some advice for you and something for the competitors to keep in mind. What's what's one tip, one technique that they uh, can be mindful of? So Brad, 100% with Brad on authentic communication and a well-supported argument. I think in this age of just complete informational overwhelm, people who can bring a logical sense to their communication style actually do a lot of really good work. So I'm excited to see that. Fabulous, fabulous. Wonderful. Okay, so this, thank you very much, Justin. We'll put you back in the audience. This is great, this is so fun. So again, before I introduce the contestants, I'll just talk a little bit about how this will work. So Vicki and I are your hosts for this evening. And of course, you've just met the judges as well. Vicki and I will ask a few questions. Our commentators will answer them to the best of their ability. And for you, in the, for the rest of you in the audience, you are free to uh, obviously watch and, and, and take a look. Maybe in the comments, you can talk about what you've witnessed and talk to everybody else. You can also, as you can see from Shindig, you may have already used it, kind of have side conversations and whatnot. But I think the, uh, the main show will be pretty engaging. All right, so let's introduce our candidates, our contestants. <clears throat> We're so used to saying candidates, I know. right? I know. <laughs> contestants. I know. I did the same thing. Lovely. All right. First up, we have Alex Mahajer. Uh, say hello. Introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. I'm Alex Mahajer. I'm a political writer, commentator, and activist. I've got bylines at HuffPost and USA Today. I'm also the PR director for the Stonewall Democratic Club. And I'll note we are working on a vote at home initiative targeting swing states to get everyone their voter registration information and uh, deadlines for voting at home. And I'm very excited to be here on this platform right here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Alex. Lulu, uh, Lala, I'm sorry, Lala Wu. Um, <laughs> I hate when I do that. Uh, my apologies. Tell us about yourself. Hi, it's so nice to meet everyone. I'm also really excited to be here. Um, I am a former attorney turned activist turned co-founder of an organization called the Sister District Project. And what we do is we organize volunteers across the country. We've got about 45,000 folks who focus exclusively on state legislative races for so many reasons I probably don't need to tell this group about. but. We're really excited to be focusing on states where the state legislature controls redistricting this year so that we can make maximize our impact ahead of 2021. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And with everyone on the stage, I'll say this, there are some high stakes this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> So, so the uh, the winner gets five hundred dollars in cash, but it might be a check because you're not supposed to mail cash. Um, <laughs> as well as uh, both contestants get some free consulting time with Convey Communications. We'll help you up your game, um, and because that is what we do, we help our leaders uh, improve their public presence, no matter the format. Um, so you get a little bit of coaching, a little bit of consultation and $500. Is everyone ready to begin? Yes. We'll ever be. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, all right. Well, so, you know, this morning I was on Twitter and I saw uh, yesterday evening noted consumer advocate, Ralph and failed presidential candidate, Ralph Nader sent this tweet. Let me read it for you. At AOC, oh, sorry, at AOC, oh, sorry, I sent at AOC the following letters suggesting ways that she can broaden her progressive impact and help many people now that she has the media spotlight. She has not replied despite repeated requests. Can anybody help, can anybody help get us to get AOC to respond? Ralph. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I still I still can't. <laughs> Over the last few years, progressives have seen an explosive rise in new leaders. Leaders who look and sound different. Leaders who, uh, frankly, uh, look more uh, like the two of you uh, than Mr. Nader. And I think that's a good thing. But how do we recon uh, reconcile with the old guard behaving like this? Lala? 
I think that it's going to be a long process. I think that the old guard is, many of them are not going to change their ways. They're going to continue on with this kind of sexist and condescending um, approach that is really, really tone deaf. Um, but it is our job as these new leaders to continue to, um, you know, be heard and lift up each other's voices. And I think it's fine that he's been ignoring him. And I think that she has every right to continue to. She's got plenty of influence on her own. She's done an amazing job along with other members of the squad, other progressive uh, elected officials who have wielded tremendous popular influence, really energized young people. And I mean, uh, before you ask the question, I hadn't thought about Ralph Nader in many, many years. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, what do we do about these uh, straight white older dudes who just can't, can't? The mansplainers at the top, Thank yes. You. I don't think that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez needs any tips from Ralph Nader on how to uh, really reach out to people and connect with people. That's really part of her strength. And I think I kind of disagree with some of Lala's answer that the old chart, oh, the old guard can't change. I think that what we really should be looking for are people who are willing to listen, who are willing to adapt, who are willing to grow, and who are willing to change. We know that some of the old guard, they've got voting records and they've uh, taken action in elected office that sometimes we don't agree with as progressives, especially in modern times. But we have to also understand that those votes and records happen in a historical context and that people can change. I'm really heartened by Joe Biden working with AOC and with Bernie Sanders to develop part of his platform. I think that that is a signal that he is willing to change and grow and move on from some of his maybe problematic past uh, voting uh, votes and his record. And I think that's what we should be really be looking for. And really AOC can just go on ignoring uh, the mansplainer in chief, just the same way she uh, handled Congressman Ted Yoho, who was very rude and disrespectful, disrespectful to her on the steps of the US uh, Capitol building. I think she's doing just fine and she doesn't need any help from Ralph Nader. Yeah, I totally agree. There are absolutely some members of the old guard who can change. And I think that um, Joe Biden also, I am encouraged by his working with the progressive left. And it's been so wonderful to see that. And, you know, one of the charges leveled against Kamala Harris is that she's a flip flopper. And I don't think that that's true at all. I think that, you know, she has been put under a spotlight because she is a woman. She's a woman of color and she's held to a different standard um, than other people around her, other straight white men, if you, uh, you know, don't mind me saying, which I don't think you do. do so, not. you know, I think that this is the kind of thing I completely agree with Alex in the sense that we are looking for those people who can change. They are, they are out there. And look, it's going to come from our side too. I think you're going to see attacks leveraged on female candidates. There's a lot of misogyny in American politics. It's endemic and it happens in a microaggressive way. This first really came to uh, my attention in 2016 with Hillary Clinton, the way she was treated. And I think we have to make sure that we challenge it as progressives. We have to be there to stand up and say, no, Kamala Harris is not a flip flopper. You can't hold her, uh, her record as district attorney and attorney general where she was tasked with enforcing the law against her now that she's a lawmaker who's tasked with making the law. I think when you're displeased with the law, you have to challenge your lawmakers to change it. And we would hope that our uh, elected officials who are uh, tasked with enforcing it are doing just that. And I, I will point to Attorney General Bill Barr as a prime example of what happens when our elected officials do not enforce the law as the leading law enforcement officials of the country. Yeah, Alex, I think I generally agree with that. I will say, however, that the reason that these prosecutorial positions are so important is because there is a ton of prosecutorial discretion, you know, because there is a lot of ability to decide what to prosecute and what not to, and a lot of leeway in how to how to enforce these laws. And so it is so much what you're saying, but there is some leeway there. And I do think that, you know, Kamala may have to um, reckon with some of the decisions that she's made in the past, but I have full confidence that she'll be able to do that head on. Agreed. Thanks, Agreed. you guys. Wow. How about this for some rising voices in the progressive movement here today? Um, this is great. Uh, let me ask you, let's keep going about uh, Joe Biden and straight white men. Mm which I'm not knocking him about because he has surrounded himself with such a diverse team. It's really 
It's so heartening to me. Anyway, this is my show. Uh, yeah. After Joe is in, inaugurated, and we have the House and, a, and the Senate by a slim majority, should our government, the new Biden administration, prosecute all the corruption that's occurred in the Trump administration and surrounding the Trump administration to the full extent of the law, or should we just turn the page and let the country move on as President Obama did uh, regarding the Bush administration and war crimes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, Lala, would you start please? Sure, I'd be glad to. I think that if there are very, very serious um, uh, things that have come out, which there have been already, I think that we should look into whether there are the resources to prosecute them. However, I don't want to be too focused on the past. I would instead be really focused on the future. I mean, the reason that we've asked for things like Trump's tax returns is because we think that it impacts his ability to govern. We think that it means that there are other interests that he's putting ahead of the interests of the American people. So, you know, it's going to be a lot less uh, relevant when he's not in office. So. I don't want to close the door on that, but I don't think that that's what we should be focusing on. We should instead be focusing on building, rebuilding from this, uh, the, the public health and economic catastrophe that is already happening because of the pandemic. Well, I yeah. think that uh, President Trump would be happy to hear that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, Alex, I'm sure you have some thoughts on that. Well, he surely would be because I think the rampant criminality that's occurred before and during his administration's tenure has been uh, the most in history. I, we've seen so many members of his cabinet in, indicted and we do know that there's been rampant criminality that's happened with the Trump administration. I agree to some extent with Lala that it might not be great for the country to be prosecuting a former president once he's out of office. But at the same time, we must be a country that respects the rule of law. I don't know that the Biden administration will need to. I think that the Southern District of New York and the Manhattan District Attorney are well on the case and waiting for the moment that he steps out of office on uh, January 21st, 2021. But look, Personally, I would like to see him prosecuted by either any one of these jurisdictional law enforcement agencies because we've got to be a country that respects the rule of law and it can't stand. We can't allow it to stand. And uh, I think Democrats have been very soft on this issue. I regret that President Obama didn't do more, especially in the final days of the 2016 election to really draw attention to the Russian interference with the 2016 uh, election, uh, for example, and also to draw attention to uh, a lot of the criminality that was happening with the Trump Organization and the Trump Foundation. I think uh, it's high time that we held him to account. And another billionaire white guy who's used uh, his uh, bully pulpit to profit, it needs to be addressed and we need to respond to it, regardless of what federal agency decides to uh, pursue those pursue those indictments. Yeah, I hear you, Alex. I, I, I totally get that perspective. And I think there's a lot of parts about that that are correct. I do think that, uh, you know, you're, you're absolutely right that there's going to be a lot of different ways um, for this to be prosecuted. And we'll see what kind of resources we have um, at the federal government. The Department of Justice is going to be really busy with hopefully restoring voting rights, you know, uh, not pursuing things like the ridiculous um, allegations against Yale for uh, discriminating against Asian American and white students, the anti affirmative action, blatantly racist measure. You know, the Department of Justice has been so stripped of so many of its important duties to actually enforce civil rights and anti-corruption and all of these things. We're going to have a lot of work to rebuild all of that. Um, and I agree, the presidency is going to be a part of it, but there's so much, you know, nitty gritty work that really needs to be done as well. Well, uh, if I can just respond to that really quickly. I think mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. The, really, the number one priority of the new administration should be focusing on voting rights. But this is going to fall on Congress. H.R. 1 was the very first bill that was passed by the 2018, the newly elected 2018 Democratic Congress. And it's sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk. And it, it's the graveyard of bills, Mitch McConnell's desk. So we really do need to take back Congress and the Senate to make sure that that happens and hopefully get the DOJ the uh, resources they need to make it happen. 
But I think all in all, you're right that the new, the new uh, priorities of this new administration need to really be focusing on voting rights, on the environment, on racial justice. And uh, I'm looking forward to that happening. And may I add gun reform, meaningful gun reform legislation. I think those are all priorities. And uh, let Trump's uh, personal criminality kind of fall out in May with the uh, various law enforcement agencies across the country. Well, yeah, and I will. If I may jump in to say right. really quickly that even if the, I certainly hope, I am hoping and hoping, and it looks more promising now that we take the Senate, the House, and the presidency, and we will be able to get HR one or a similar bill passed, um, which has so many important measures about voting rights in it. Uh, no matter what, though, so much of the administration of this kind of voting rights related policy happens at the state level. And it is critical. And since we are on this national platform right now, I would like to use my platform to say that state what happens in the states is so incredibly important and it's not sexy and it doesn't sound that glamorous but everybody should be paying more attention to it because it's where the real policy is made that's actually going to make a difference in people's lives well before we get to any policy making we still have to win this election whether it's the house the senate the presidency or state legislatures one of the things that I think Democrats did not reconcile with in 2016, um, and therefore we lost, is this this country's use of race in politics. The Trump the Trump campaign obviously won using race baiting, anti immigrant, and anti black racist tropes, and now we're seeing it again. Kamala Harris is the VP pick, but right away the attacks on Harris have gotten dark. Harris, who's born in Oakland, California, has just been subjected to racist birther conspiracies by the president himself uh, and his lawyer. Uh, this is not the first time. This is not the first time they brought up uh, um, this kind of attack. What are Democrats supposed to do? How do we take this head on? How do we reconcile this? Uh, Alex, why don't you start us off? Look, this is the same tactic that we saw happened in 2016. There's a massive Russian misinformation campaign. It's not a conspiracy, everybody, it is happening. We know that all of our intelligence agencies reported on this in 2016. They are coming at us again, letting us know that the Russians are engaged in a massive misinformation campaign meant to denigrate, uh, create a specter of doubt over our candidates. And then it's particularly insidious that they use racial messaging and anti-women messaging in their talking points meant to target Kamala Harris and even Joe Biden. And this is only going to ramp up. And the solution has to be that as private citizens, that we combat and challenge these narratives when we see them. There are way more of us than there are 200 Russian agents working in a military bunker for 24 to 36 hour shifts, pumping misinformation onto our social media feeds meant to uh, create doubt about our candidates. We've got to challenge it when we see it. We've got to be judicious about the way we process information. We've got to be much smarter. If it's not a vetted news source, if it's a Twitter feed with an egghead and multiple numbers at the end, and it seems a little suspicious, question it and challenge it. There are more of us than there are of them, and we've got to get right as a nation and stand up together, unified, re really regardless of political affiliation, but I think it's gonna fall on our side uh, much more to challenge these false narratives. And also stand up for women and stand up for black women. They deserve that and they are the backbone of our movement. And uh, it's gotta be something that we are coordinated about. I would never deign to call myself an ally, but I think effective allyship is about challenging these narratives when we see them. Lala, what do you think? We failed in 2016 to do any of these things. What are we supposed to do this time in 2020? So I agree with everything that Alex just said. I will also challenge the premise a little bit that these dog whistles and these sexist attacks that they were the only thing that uh, worked and that enabled Trump to win. I mean, he also, we won the popular vote by almost 3 million votes. Let's not forget that. There are more, as Alex just said, there are many more of us, not just the 20 Russian um, you know, trolls and bots, but there are more Democrats, more progressives in this country. It was the Electoral College. It was fake news. It was voter suppression. It was all of these different things that led to uh, Trump's victory. And I think that Trump's campaign, and I don't know if his campaign has any sway over him, but at least Trump, you know, thinks that what he needs to do to win over these white suburban women is to go back to a 1950s kind of idea of law and order, being tough on crime. Let's keep the, you know, suburbs white and sterile the way that they are. 
I think he thinks that that is going to lead him to victory. Um, but I, 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 I don't think that that's the way to do it. You know, I think that there are more of us. I think that we need to continue to elevate our messaging about the diversity of our base. And we are right on the issues and we need to continue to elevate those messages um, and not get locked into this idea that um, uh, that these dog whistles are, are going to work. We need to continue. I mean, we have to be vigilant and fight them, um, but there's more of us and they're there of them. That said, we also need to look out for voter suppression because although the polls look really good, you know, like even though um, I, I look at the polls and I'm very, very, very encouraged, it doesn't, a poll, polls don't equal votes, you know, and everything that's been going on with USPS and um, with the blatant attacks, the, the, the attempts that he's made, that he said the quiet part out loud, the phrase that everybody's heard already so many times in the last couple of days, I mean, he is trying to suppress the vote and there it won't be some grand militaristic stand. It's gonna be a death by a million cuts and we need to be on the lookout for that. And Lala, can I just briefly respond? I think you make excellent points and you're absolutely right that we need to be focusing on all the different interferences with our electoral process. And one of the major ones that no one is looking at is the voter cross check system that is purging millions of voters from voter rolls meant to, to disenfranchise voters. 1.9 validly cast ballots were cast in 2016 that were not counted. That is because of these voter purges. We know that in this current election cycle, over 16 million voter registrations have been purged. This is a coordinated effort by Republican secretaries of states and heads of state that are meant to uh, minimize the vote and reduce the amount of voters that get to turn out. So yes, it is USBS. Yes, it is this dog whistling, but we've got to make sure you are registered to vote. Check your voter registration, and we've got to all be a coordinated effort amongst all progressive groups, really getting the vote out and making sure people know you might have registered to vote in the last election, but you may not be registered now. So check your voter registration, make sure you're registered, and make be prepared to crawl over glass and fire and brimstone to make sure you get your ballot cast this year. Kamala and Joe said it very well in their speech the other day. We've got to, uh, we really need a mandate, not just a win. It's not gonna just, a popular vote win is not gonna suffice this time. It's gotta be a mandate. Yeah, absolutely. And I just wanna highlight another really important thing is in the absence of a reliable USPS, drop boxes are gonna be incredibly, incredibly important. And it sounds mundane, but it is a way for people to drop off their ballot so that they don't have to rely on the USPS to get their ballot in on time because late ballots are also gonna be a huge problem. Mm -hmm. However, you know, drop boxes are not required in every state. There are a lot of groups that are fighting to get them required um, in many states, but that is, the time is running out. And even in states where they are required, like Ohio, uh, the, the Republican government there, they are only putting one, their current plan is to only put one drop box in each of their 88 counties. For some people, this means a multi-hour drive to drop off their ballot, which is unacceptable. It's a national outrage that the voter, the GOP uh, strategy is to minimize the amount of polling locations that are available in urban areas and areas that are heavily minority, minority populated and also take away your ability to vote by mail. It should be a national outrage. We should be screaming about this from the hilltops and let me take a moment to scream about it now. The GOP strategy is to make sure you don't vote. So wherever you are, get in touch with your state legislatures, get in touch with your senators, get in touch with your congressmen and make sure that the USPS is adequately funded that they do not close voting locations in heavily minority populated areas. Voting is the Amer is an American cornerstone of democracy, and it is under a full-blown assault by the Republicans, and we've got to be challenging this in the 82 days that are left before Election Day, because I'm troubled by that. The 82 days left. Eek! <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well... Arshad, the judges have their work cut out for them today, don't you think? I think they do. I think <laughs> they do. Um, thank you to both of the contestants, uh, Alex and Lala. We're going to put you back down to the audience while we bring the judges up. Thank you. Thanks, guys. It was. Uh,
That went by so fast. I can't cannot believe how fast that went. <laughs> it's true. Now, again, I just want to say what we have at stake here is five hundred dollars and uh, and and some coaching sessions with Convey Communications. But both of our contestants, having made it to the finals, will get something uh, with Convey. So we're happy about that. But there can only be one winner. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Jocelyn. Tell us, what did you think? And who's your choice? So, <laughs> I, I first I wanna say this is very difficult because uh, I think that that was, that was very entertaining for me to watch. And it's an incredibly well argued. I think that both Lala and Alex have, Lala, I can tell you're a lawyer, you're very, very intelligent and just so many nuanced points on both sides. I think ultimately you both offer a lot, but my choice is Alex for the very simple reason that he seemed a lot more comfortable. And, you know, my guiding thought is, okay, so who would I be watching on a Sunday morning television show? Ultimately, as someone, you know, who does this, who is on camera for so much of her work week, a lot of it is about being comfortable. Unfortunately, I wish it were more about being brilliant because then I think we would have a better media sphere. But a lot of it is just about feeling. And Lala, I think that you definitely got there at different points because you're clearly just a brilliant thinker and a brilliant communicator. But Alex seemed to have more just general confidence in front of the camera and that's because that's so much of what punditry is he is ultimately my choice what are your thoughts though brad i first want to thank both candidates because i think the stage presence that you brought and the uh, wealth of knowledge that you both brought to the material was clearly on display um you know I think those of us who do a lot of training with folks readily acknowledge that some of the hardest training that we do is when we're doing direct to camera training. And that's become even more difficult in an era where we're all sitting in our living rooms and we're, <laughs> we're actually not even looking at TV cameras. We're looking at little pinhole cameras on our computer. Yeah. So the fact that you both were able to, you know, show through your body language and, and show through the way that you presented the materials that uh, you were ready to, to, you know, give these topics the important, you know, the, the important weight in which they deserve was awesome. Um, to you, Alex, um, I think that you are a phenom. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, listening to you uh, talk in the way that you were able to parry with Lala was something that I thought you did in an incredible way. Um, I thought that you were able to articulate your points in a way that was extremely emotionally connective. Um, if there was any sort of critique whatsoever, what I would do is I would encourage you to kind of look through and ensure that you know you really detailed when you're talking about um, voter purges and make sure that like you're able to articulate how we know that it is a coordinated effort. Because again, one of the things that could happen as you're communicating something that rightfully needs to be communicated is that you're not giving enough folks to really see and draw the connections between these elected officials and groups. So I would do a little bit more just to ensure that if you are going down that road, that you have it. Talala, I thought that you did fantastic work. Um, and I thought that the analytical perspective that you brought on a whole range of issues uh, was able to really connect with folks and really uh, bring to folks kind of a sense that they could trust you. The one critique that I definitely would have is that given the fact that now we are in such a difficult time period, you might want to think about how to communicate the importance of prosecuting Trump in a much more evocative way. Because we are in a period where folks need to understand that folks within his administration will be held to account for the things that they've done. And we need to be drum beating and putting pressure on democratic elected officials who are going to be taking over that we can't make the same mistake that Obama made uh, at the end of the economic crisis where Americans saw no bankers go to jail, saw nobody held accountable for the things that happened and really created the environment that we live in now where people are questioning the rule of law itself. So I think that talking more and getting into that is it makes sense. 
to get to what I think. What's the verdict, Brad? I got to give it just a slight edge to Lala, which I believe might push us to a lightning round. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yes, I do too. All right, lightning round. Let's get the judges out of here. Let's get rid of Brad. And his old lightning round. Thank you. Thank you, both of you, Johnson Brad. and Brad. Very insightful. All right, let's get, let's, Brad, get, get. It's the lightning Brad. round. Graham. <laughs> thank you guys for your comments. And also, I just want to thank Lala. She's really fantastic and it's really enjoyable to listen to her. I could go around with you all day, Lala. <laughs> well, you'll get 60 more seconds to listen to each of you. Because I want to say that too. I was I was messaging Alex. And I was like, "You are awesome. I can listen to you all day." So <laughs> we're friends now. <laughs> so here is a lightning round challenge. You will each have thirty seconds to answer this one question. It'll be the same question, um, and I will have a timer on it. Wait, you I'm going to flip a coin to see yeah. who goes first. Oh yes! Oh, excellent. I love it. Um, I shouldn't be shoulder shimming if this is real TV, but Lala. All right, Lala goes first. You have 30 seconds. I'm going to put a timer on. One second. Will Alex oh. be having the same question? Yes. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Lala, answer me this. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Yes or no? Absolutely. I love pineapple on pizza. I think that salty things and sweet things are a beautiful pairing and that they should go together. I think that there's so much more than just Canadian bacon and pineapple. I think you can also have pineapple and jalapeno, pineapple and, and regular bacon. There's a lot of different options. Absolutely. Sugar belongs on pizza. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Wow. All right. Thank you, Lala. Alex. What do you think? Does pineapple belong on pizza? Go. The problem of pineapple on pizza is a widespread and deeply troubling phenomenon that must be stopped in its tracks. Pineapple has no business perverting the intention of the Italians when they created such a delicious morsel of beauty that is the pizza. And we must celebrate the pizza and defend the pizza at all costs. So no, I do not support pineapples on pizza, and I encourage you all to support me in this very important endeavor. I can see that you're a pizza textualist. <laughs> I haven't had a pizza. Right. Uh, I'm also impressed that you both answered major case in less than 30 seconds. Yeah. Nice. I all right. pineapple, by the way, I just had to take the opposing viewpoint. <laughs> Of course you did. Of course you did. Let's get the judges back up here. Judges, does this sway your vote? Can we can we can we finally settle on a winner? <laughs> Maybe. That's right. That's right. Oh, look at Brad's <laughs> message. I I know. I love it. Uh, all right, Brad, you're up. I am a gentleman who believes in the chocolate chip bagel with the veggie cream cheese. I'm picking it out. Not your bias in there, I see. Jocelyn. Oh my goodness. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with uh I'm gonna stick to my guns. Pineapple does not belong on pizza. Okay, wow. This has never happened in the history of Pundit Cup, of the Pundit Cups that I've actually gone to anyway. So, what do we do? Okay. Yeah, it's usually very clear who is the winner and who isn't the it winner. Is, it is. And it's often very hard to figure out, but I just the final round, um, the last Pundit Cup, and it was hard, but I at least freaking picked somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what we do. Here's what we do. Here's what we do. Um, we're going to reach down deep into our pockets. Lala, Alex, you're both winners. Both of you will receive $100 wow. in the mail. Both of you will receive a free coaching session wow. from Bay Communications. Yeah. Um, we will schedule them with you and we will get you, we will elevate you. This is, I swear this wasn't it's, planned. I am like the RuPaul double play of you guys. <laughs> you all have also very, if I can just pop in here, you have different styles. It is absolutely different. So, um, so I think that that added to some of the difficulty. I I want to see 
both of you on national network broadcast television. So we will work to make that happen. Um, so uh, at Convey Communications, we'll work with you to coach you uh, uh, to the end. Um, some of our other sponsors like Fenton and Fireside um, to do more of the, the placement and everything else. So um, the winners. Hold on. Oh, oh. I have something special for each of you. Oh. Um, but I would like, you both have to come down because we can only fit four uh, people on the uh, podium. So uh, Nathaniel, if you would bring our contestants down and I will. <clears throat> show them part of the, oh, and you will show them part of the prize. I swear we did not obviously plan for this. Well, no, because there's two. There, there's one of each. Yeah. There we go. There you go. There's your prizes, kids. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to be prepared for your eventuality. So, <laughs> Vicky, where did you find these pictures? <laughs> On like the interwebs. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Tell the world you are both, you are both the 2020 Pundit Cup champions. Uh, it, this is difficult. This is difficult. This is not even, this is not what I wanted. So we, <laughs> I we wanted could, one. I couldn't be more pleased that it's both, I could not have, I could not have made a fit today. So. Oh my God. Okay. Oh, no one will take us seriously. I want to thank everybody in the <laughs> audience wait, today. Wait, come to the same conclusion. Uh, um, uh, let's uh, raise your hands in the uh, little raise your hand thing if you are pleased with the outcome. Wow. Okay. That's One, what I'm two, talking nine, about. Eleven. Twelve. Ooh, if it's if it's if it's more if it's more than sixteen, then that's then that's that's the majority of people. Uh, hit the little okay. raise hand uh, thing if you believe that this was uh, both people are the winners. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right, let's bring them back up, um, Nathaniel, so they can say goodbye to everybody. All right, let's have them say goodbye. It is two o'clock, so we will uh, give a, a quick, a quick goodbye. We can get uh, uh, Jocelyn. Uh, not Jocelyn. Sorry, Jocelyn. Not you. <laughs> not this time. Oh, Lala. And can you bring them back up if they're still here? Lala and Alex, are they still here, Nathaniel? There we go. He's doing it. There's a little lag time. All right. Okay. Each of you, say goodbye. I'm heading for <laughs> Thank you all. Check out Sister District. Forward. Check out all of Alex's forward. things. She's like. <laughs> <laughs> I love that picture. Thank you, guys. And thank you to the judges. And thank goodbye. you all. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. 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 <laughs> okay. I just, just can you promise me that when this pandemic is over, we can get together and have a drink because I would love to have a drink with both of you. You're both so fun, so fun. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I, I promise for sure. Right. Oh, someday. <laughs> All right. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Everybody. You're great, Alex. <laughs> Real pleasure. Here's an yeah. application to join the communist party. Music. What? what? Well, let me put it to you this way. Are you in favor of democracy? You must be in favor of democracy. Well, if you're in favor of democracy, here's sign, sign here. How do you feel about the...